Most gracious God, we come before you, Lord, just saying thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment of study. I thank you for each person that's on this call and those that have yet to join us. I ask your continued blessings over each and every one, your blessings of protection, your blessings of prosperity, uh, your blessings of productivity, uh, so that we may be about all that you would have us to be. Lord, you're such an awesome God. You're a never-failing God. You're a keeping God, and for that, once again, we're just thankful. Lord, I um, ask that you open up our minds, that we may be receptive to this lesson, open our hearts that we may internalize it, and ultimately, you get the praise, glory, and honor that you are due as a result of us sharing this lesson with others as we apply it in our lives. These things we ask in your mighty and majestic son's name, amen. All right. This is the second lesson in our series entitled Remember. And a lot of us don't know what we need to remember. So after studying this lesson today, uh, students need always to remember what the meaning is in partaking of the Lord's Supper. Many of us are just going through the motions, and I say many of us, uh, because it gets to be rote. But um, they go through the motion of taking the Lord's Supper. Uh, we haven't given any thought as to what it is or what it is about. But we also need to remember a couple other things. We need to remember how he lived as Jesus. We also need to remember why Jesus died and what Jesus said regarding the Lord's Supper. Uh, then we need to share that same good news with others. Prayerfully, this weekend, when we take communion, you will be a little bit more mindful of the bread and the cup. So as a means of introducing, uh, just like we talked about last week, we are a very forgetful people. That's why we need, we desperately need some reminders. And in this lesson, we're just called to remember the most significant sacrifice in all of human history and the fact that there is a two thousand over, there's a memorial that's over 2,000 years that was erected in the upper room in Jerusalem so that we would never forget that last supper because Christ needs us to remember and he also wants us to remember. Now, can't speak for everybody's church, but growing up at St. Stephen, at 1008 South 15th Street, there was a piece of furniture in front of the pulpit called the communion table. And that table, you didn't just treat any old kind of way. In front of that table was the inscription, In Remembrance of Me, which is the title of our lesson. And as I said, you didn't just treat it any old kind of way. You didn't lean against it. You didn't sit on it. You didn't lay on it. You didn't play on it. Ours had a thick glass covering. And at some point, don't know how it happened, but that thick glass covering, I think it was about a half inch thick, got chipped. My dad, who was the church treasurer, and also uh, one of the church handymen that we had readily available made sure that that chipped glass didn't stay there. It was replaced before the next Sunday because that table was held in reverence. Now, we are forgetful people. God knew that we would have a faulty memory. God knew we would not remember what we needed to. So he established some memorials. The first memorial that he established was for the Passover. And we read about the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. 
I'm going to start at verse 21, where it says, Moses assembled all the elders of Israel. He said, select a lamb for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the bowl of blood and smear it on the lintel and on the doorpost. Uh, the two doorposts, so the lintel and the two doorposts. No one is to leave the house until morning. God will pass through to strike down, strike Egypt down. When he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, God will pass over the doorway. He will let the destroyer, he won't let the destroyer enter your house to strike you down with ruin. Verse 24, keep this word. Is the law for you and your children. How long? Forever. When you enter the land which God will give you, as he promised, keep doing this. And when your children say to you, why are we doing this? Tell them. It's the Passover sacrifice to God who passed over the homes of the Israelites in Egypt. And when he hit Egypt with death, but rescued us. People bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites went in and did what God commanded Moses and Aaron. Had com commanded Moses and Aaron. They did it all. And for those of you Ten Commandments buffs, which you should have seen Saturday night, at midnight, Verse 29, at midnight, God struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, right down to the firstborn of the prisoner locked up in jail, also the firstborn of the animals. So, God established the Passover so that Israel will remember how he brought them out of Egypt, how he brought them out of slavery, and how he brought them out of Pharaoh's control. In fact, Pharaoh got so upset, he said, okay, Moses, take all these uh, folk up out of here and not only take them, but take their cattle and their sheep too. But somehow or another, we tend to forget. That scene in the Ten Commandments where you hear all that screaming and hollering, I would never forget the sound of all that screaming and hollering. But the next generation would would not remember what happened because either they were too small or we didn't do what we needed to do, which is pass it on. That is our problem today. Those under our charge, our children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, they think usually there's a money tree associated with your name uh, because they forget, um, we forget to tell them how we made it. Last week, uh, as the Jews were celebrating Passover, uh, they were interviewing this young man on the TV, and he said, um, they're just pretty much doing what we do every year, uh, which is we're, we're just going through the motions. That, that was how that was presented. So... Here, in essence, is what that Passover is to be about. For the Israelites, it's keeping the seriousness of this moment for them to look backward. Uh, and we all need to look backward uh, to remember that what great things God had done for them and their forefathers. And any mercies to ourselves or to our four parents should never be forgotten. Uh, and
and that God should be praised as a result and our faith should become encouraged. So it was to look back and it's also to look forward, to look forward to the great sacrifice of the Lamb of God um, who in the fullness of time would serve as our Passover uh, with his life um, by dying for us. So we're, we're forgetful people. God knew that we would have a faulty member, memory. In fact, if I was to give this quiz and if I say I'm going to give a prize to the first one that responds quickly, uh, how about this? And the only person who can't answer is my sister, Grace. What was the title of last week's lesson? Star six to respond. Remember Jesus. Okay, that sounds like Ann. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't call my name. That's correct. I did not. <laughs> All right. Dave, I believe you Dave, I believe you was almost right until Ann said something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, let's go by this. What did we talk? What were some of the things we talked about that we needed to remember? Well, just a few seconds. Okay, ago. the uh, goodness of Jesus, his oh, death, okay, his, his deity. What was that? What else? Uh, his death. His death. And then I've got suffering of life. Didn't put in the notes, back, so I don't know what it means. Okay. The dynamics of, of the gospel. Which involve what? What's the dynamics of the gospel? Remembering, um, remembering his redemption and the. Uh, Resurrection, his return, all of that good stuff. Right. Is that what you're asking? All right. Yep, yep. Uh, we're also to remember the deliverance of the gospel. Who's to deliver the gospel? We are. Uh, us. And there's going to come a time of great what? Of great deception? Sacrifice. Deception, and that deception is going to turn people to go towards Christ? No. It's mm -mm. going to turn them off. And so, therefore, we need to remember that we are also to be diligent. We are called to do one thing and one thing alone. Uh, so, here gets to be that next question. There was a question that I posed at the end of class last week. What was that question? Because it should pull you into this week. No, oh, they I feel bad. I ain't got a clue what this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I asked the question last week. How do we go about making sure that the gospel is shared during this COVID season? Remember that? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. I want you to plant that in your brains because I don't ever want you to forget how we should go about sharing the gospel. All righty. Okay. You got it, everybody? All right. So, as a result of us having a faulty memory, Joshua, God had Joshua to establish a memorial for crossing the Jordan into the promised land. And we read about that in Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, where it says, When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them, 
take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark uh, of the Lord, your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it to on your shoulder. Twelve stones in all, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And you will tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. And they are there to this day. So Joshua told them what to do uh, because of what the Lord had told him to do, to tell them to do. It's not one of those situations where you had a lot of say so. The crazy part is pretty soon they're going to forget that the God who delivered them from Egypt it brought them over to the promised land. They're, they're going to forget about that. All they're going to remember is there are giants in the land. They're not going to remember the grapes. They're going to remember that they were grasshoppers in their eyes. Okay? So we are forgetful people. God knew we would have a faulty memory. There are some things that are easy to forget. Trust me. <laughs> Very easy. So Jesus established the Lord's Supper, also called communion, so that we would remember him and what he did for us. Now, what is communion? And I don't mean in respect to what we do every second Sunday. Anybody? What does the word communion mean? I guess there's a better way to word that. Anybody? Star six to respond. Coming together. Uh, Jesus gave his life for us. Okay, that's the Lord's Supper. It's the Lord's Supper. Okay. Yeah. What is communion? Coming together. It is that. It is the sharing or exchanging of thoughts or feelings. It is coming together, especially on a mental or spiritual level. In other words, you can walk down the street and be in communion with God because it is just... I, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency sometimes as I walk, I pray. So that ends up being that great communion time between me and God. It, it was something that uh, was, I, I didn't think about it uh, because many of you know my favorite scripture uh, says to Pray always or pray without ceasing. So, usually, especially when I was walking at night, I, I didn't give it a second thought to just be talking to God the whole time I'm walking. Uh, and as a result, um, 
I, I remained a whole lot more peaceful and probably need to get back to that today because there are a lot of things that uh, cause you to go crazy. Well, we're going to see in two passages here where Jesus reminds us what we need to do. So in Luke chapter 22, I'm going to come from the message translation, uh, starting in verse 14. When it was time, he sat down, all the apostles with him. So that means that even Judas was there. In other words, there was still time for him to get it together, even though he was not. So when all the apostles with him and said, you have no idea how much I've looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before I enter my time of suffering. It's the last one I'll eat until we eat it together in the kingdom of God. Taking the cup, he blessed, blessed it, then said, take this and pass it among you. As for me, I'll not drink wine again until the kingdom of God arrives. Taking bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given up for you. Eat it in my memory. He did the same with the cup after suffering, saying, This cup is the new covenant written in my blood, blood poured out for you. So he took the cup, he gave thanks for the cup, and divided it amongst them. Now, have you ever wondered what Jesus said when he gave thanks? Was he giving thanks for the cup of wine? Or was he giving thanks for the fact that he was about to die for us being in grapes. Uh, because during this same time period, what were the disciples doing? They were arguing over who was going to be the greatest. So, in this passage, it's kind of interesting and intriguing um, to find out of all the gospel writers who recorded this event, only Luke mentions that the Lord's Supper was to become a memorial feast when he said, do this in remembrance of me. Those words are not found with Mark, with Matthew, or with John. In fact, the only other place that they're noted is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul says, let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is centrally important. I receive my instructions from the Master himself and have passed them on to you. The Master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in, to remember me. After supper, he did the same with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink it, each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words or actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. So, it's really interesting that the two people that recorded that night were not even in the upper room. Luke and Paul are the only two that, that mentioned this. 
And it's really important that we do remember uh, as the table in front of the in front of the pulpit would read, "Do this in remembrance of me." So Jesus says, "With desire, I desire to have this meal with you." This is no routine Passover. It was significant to Jesus because he had great compassion and wanted it to share it with them, with the disciples, even though they were a bunch of knuckleheads at this point, many of them. Jesus' desire was fueled by two things. It was first fueled by his desire for his disciples to know the true meaning of the Passover. And we read that in the Exodus Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, uh, where he said, select the lamb for your families and slaughter the lamb. And verse 21, that's why I started there. Take a bunch of his, dip it in the bowl of blood and smear it on the lintel and the doorpost so no one is to leave until morning. God will pass through and strike Egypt down. When he sees the blood on the lintel, and the doorpost, God will pass over the doorway. He won't let the destroyer enter your house to strike you down with ruin. Now, for years, his people only celebrated a remembrance. But now, Jesus is saying, I'm the real thing. The real thing is here. The true Lamb of God was standing before them. And the real Passover was about to be celebrated. In fact, John the Baptist said in, in John 1, 29, uh, the next day John the Baptist, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then again in John 1, 36, as Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look. There is the Lamb of God. So, if you're wondering what you have been called to do, because each of us has a calling, each of us has something to do, we can't save nobody. We can't even save ourselves. How are we going to save somebody else? All we're called to do and do this with a vengeance, is to point folk to Jesus. We're to do this with our witnessing. We're to do this with our testimony, with our lives, with teaching, preaching, singing. All we're to do is point folk to Jesus. So no longer would, Jesus, would God's people celebrate the remembrance every year. This was to be the last, the final Passover meal. The Passover meal was handing the baton of memory to another memorial feast, the Lord's Supper. The second thing that fueled Jesus' desire to have this meal with his disciples was his desire to, for them to remember him. So there are three things that we need to remember. The first thing that we need to remember is how Jesus lived. The second thing we need to remember is why Jesus died. And the third thing we need to remember is what Jesus said in regards to communion. So, how did he live? Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, Think of yourselves the way Christ thought of himself. Uh oh, that's a little dangerous. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't even claim privileges. Instead, 
He lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. And as we discussed last week, the Romans, who were the initiators of this crucifixion, were not allowed to be crucified. But it was okay to crucify the Jews or anybody else. Now, we saw his humility in as much as in John chapter 13, I think it's 13 through 16, we know that as the upper room discourse. And this is where he stripped himself down uh, and washed the disciples' feet. That was something the slave was supposed to do, not our master. But he graciously did it. Well, and remember I started verse 5 off saying, think of yourselves the way Christ thought of himself. Would you be willing to be, as a human being, become a lowly creature like an ant to tell other ants that the ant eater was present? No. You'd be ready to pull out the can of raid and spray the ant for saying that. Well, we're going to see a couple of things as to how Christ lived. First thing is he lived humbly. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He took the position as a slave. John 13, 3 through 5 says, Jesus knew the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with a towel around his waist. So are we willing to become a servant or a slave in order to, for others to come to Christ? We say we do, but many times that comes at a heavy price. And then we start looking back at that John 666 passage where it says, this is too hard. <laughs> the other thing, as he humbly lived, was that as a result of his humbleness, we need to have the same attitude. Not an attitude of self-importance. I'm not washing anybody's feet. Not an attitude of self-ambition, which is to be like a couple of the disciples. Remember James and John had their mother to come to Jesus and say, make my sons great. Then we had Judas, who was going to betray him. Then we also have self-importance, self selfish ambition, and we also have selfish pride. D.L. Moody, Moody said, be humble or you'll stumble. And Jefferson Davis, same Jefferson Davis, who uh, uh, even a broken clock can be right twice a day, said, never be haughty to the humble. Never be humble to the haughty. So, he lived humbly. He also lived purposefully. He knew what he was here to do. Many times, 
we don't know what we're here to do. That poses a problem. <coughs> so we see in Luke Verse 18 and 19, God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. Sent me to announce pardon to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To set the burdened and the battered free. To announce this is God's year to act. And boy, do we need to claim that right now, that this is, year, this is God's year to act. Jesus knew what he was here to do. And I'm going to throw that back to you. What have you been called to do? If nothing else, you've been called to point folk to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. Look at Jesus. Don't look at me. Look at Jesus. Sometimes, unfortunately, in order for people to see Jesus, they have to look at you. So, how's your living? The Messiah was to preach the gospel. The Messiah was to minister. He knew what he was called to do. He was to heal the brokenhearted. He was not only to help the brokenhearted, but he was to heal the brokenhearted. Now, Many times as we get ready to do some things, we don't have the power, but the word of God does. And nothing calms this beast down like hearing the word of God. He was to give sight to the blind, not only those spiritually blind, but those who were physically blind. However, we don't have that power. And then if that wasn't good enough, he was doing all of this. He was to set at liberty those who were bruised. He was to set free those who were physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually bruised. And he was to do all of this as he was getting ready to be crucified. John, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 9, verse 51 says, When it came close for his ascension, ascension, he gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to Jerusalem. In other words, he purposely set himself ready to go. He knew he was going to be handed over. He knew he was going to be crucified. He knew he was there to do the will of God. So he lived humbly. He lived purposefully. He lived powerfully. First party, he turned water into wine. He cast out legions of demons, not just a few here and there, legions. He, we, we think the Catholics know how to have a fish fry. Jesus knew how to have a fish fry. He fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. He calmed violent storms. He opened up the eyes of the blind. He walked on water. He cleansed leprosy. And he even raised the dead. Because he had power. And he used his power. John 10 and 18 says, He says, No one takes my life from me. I willingly give it up. I have the power to give it up and the power to receive it back again just as my father commanded me to do. And then in John 19, he says, starting in verse 8, when Pilate heard him say this, he became more uneasy and returned to the palace again and spoke to Jesus. Where do you come, where do you come from? But Jesus gave him no reply. So Pilate said to him, won't you speak to me? Do you realize I have the power to set you free and I have the power to have you crucified? Then Jesus spoke up. You have no power at all against me except what was given to you from above. 
His power doesn't come from the White House, doesn't come from Capitol Hill or the governor's house. His power comes from God. And in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came, a deter undeterred, went right ahead, and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission to you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way, marking them by baptism in threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of it all I've commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up until the end of the age. And many of us know this same statement as all power is given to me. Okay? God authorized and commanded me to commission you. So, we've been commissioned because he lived humbly, powerfully, purposefully. He lived lovingly. Jesus' love knew no bounds. It didn't draw lines in the sand. He loved everyone. Rich and the poor, sick and the healthy, the black and the white, the Jew, the Gentile, male, the female, old and the young, the gay, the straight, the sinner and the saint, democratic and republican. Friend and enemy, Jesus lived lovingly. First John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to fight, ought to give our lives for others. Not necessarily in the dying. Uh, we, we should be willing to die for some other folks. But it is more so for sacrifice as a sacrifice for others to come to Christ. And I know for a fact it takes a sacrifice for others to know Christ. It doesn't mean that you can do certain things when you have a specific task to do. And just as a general reminder, um, we have from the greatest chapter that Paul ever wrote, which is Romans chapter 8, uh, we get some powerful words. Um, I'm going to think in our message here, in our lesson, uh, it starts at verse 31. I think I'm going to jump back to verse 30, where it reads, after God made that decision, what decision was that? Well, let's go back just a little bit. To verse 29, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the onset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. In other words, we or to model ourselves after Christ. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed up by calling them, <laughs> by calling people by name. Hmm. Once again, we're hearing that he knows our name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then again, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end. 
gloriously completing what he had begun. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly or freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? So that means that you and I are God's chosen. Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who raised life, raised to life for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the very presence of God at this moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, hard times, or hatred. Not hunger. Not homelessness. Not bullying threats. Not backstabbing. Not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. Remember that sacrifice I was telling you? Jesus loves us. That's why we are able to do it freely. Verse 38. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, no thing, living or dead, angelic or demon, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. So, we see right off the bat, um, how he lived. He lived a life of love. And now we're going to remember why he died. Simply put, to cancel our debt. Every man and woman who's ever lived owed a debt that they could never pay. He paid a debt that he did not owe. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, For all, for the wages of sin is death. So, we're sin and fallen short, and the wages of sin is death. Colossians 3, 13 through 15 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses, dead in your sins, and the circumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having, given, having forgiven us all our trespasses by counseling the debt the record of debt that stood against us in the legal demands. In other words, we were wrong. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and putting them to shame by triumphing over them in him. In other words, we have a receipt that says Jesus paid it all when it came to our debt. So he canceled the the debt, and he removed the distance. Our sins, what separates us from God is our sins. But Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is too sharp to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, from your God. Your sins have hidden his his face from you, so that he will not hear. Ephesians 2 and 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, uh, now in Christ Jesus, you, want, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, 
You see, it was to counsel the dead, to remove the distance, and to take away your guilt. The gospel is not the good news of partial forgiveness. <laughs> I'm so thankful. It's the good news of complete forgiveness. There's no half-stepping with God. That half-stepping stuff is what we do. Acts 13, 39 says, Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the, the law of Moses. In Romans 3, 24 says, Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Then, right back again to that greatest chapter that Paul ever wrote, Romans chapter 8. Uh, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, while the accuser is saying, uh, you did this, 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 and this. It's true, but Jesus is saying, I, I've got this covered. So, not only is it to take away our guilt, but it's to bring people together. He died that we might have communion. Ah, get it now? We might come together, even though it seems that we're more distant than ever. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 14. He tore down the wall that, you, that we use to keep each other at a distance. He repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and foot loops, foot hoop, excuse me, footnotes, that it hindered more than it helped. Then he started over. Instead of continuing with the two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace And that was the end of the hostility. Our Christianese still sometimes keeps us apart. But as we keep living, we learn to talk to people a little different. Verse 17, Christ came and preached peace to you, outsiders, and peace to us, insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father, who, the black, the white, the rich, the poor, the male, the female, female, we all have the same equal access to the Father and to give us new life. Galatians 6 and 14 says, for my part, I'm going to boast about Nothing but the cross of our Master Jesus. Because of that cross, I have been crucified in relation to the world, set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into the little patterns that they dictate. I have been set free. Okay? Colossians 1 and 22 says, You yourselves are a case study of what he does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him your trouble at every chance you got. But now, by giving him completely at the cross, actually dying for you, cross brought you over to God's side and then put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. And in this life, image is nothing 
but Christ is everything. So, remember how he lived, remember what he did, and we need to remember what he said. He said two main things. First, I am the resurrection. He asked Martha, uh, do you believe you'll see your brother again? And she said, oh, yeah, I'll see him at the resurrection. And that was when Jesus spoke up and said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Then he asked her, do you believe this? So the two things he said, I am the resurrection. I will return. And in his return, he says in John chapter 14, don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. There's plenty of room for you in my father's home. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so that you can live where I live. Nothing should give us more comfort that he's coming again. And as you take the cup and as you take the bread, remember how he lived gives you direction. Why he, why he died gives you confidence because his death gives us sleep when we die. And what he said about the resurrection and his return should give us hope. Because he lives, I know who holds the future. And life is worth the living because he lives. Well, what do I not want you to forget? What I want you to continuously remember is how we should be able to go about spreading the gospel in spite of COVID. So, what I'd like for you to do is to continue to pray for those that are on the battlefield. Pray for yourself. I thank you for joining us today. I thank you for being with us today. And one other thing we need to remember is to thank God for the example he's given us as to how to live, why he died, and what he said. We need to share with others the hope, confidence, and direction you receive from living for Christ. If we do that, we're going to treat others differently. We need to share with those who don't know and help others remember what Christ did for us on the cross by being raised from the dead. Um, we also need to know that our giving helps others experience this awesomeness of Christ because, as Billy Hollins used to say, we need money for ministry. And in times of distress, we're all going to have some distress. And in times of doubt, we're all going to have some times of doubt. We need to, in other words, call to the forefront of those situations God's goodness and the hope that we have through Christ. Week's lesson is entitled, Don't Forget to Remember. Once again, I'm glad you joined us today. Prayerfully, something's been said that will uh, brighten your heart, cause you to remember what we need to be about, because there are some things that we need to continually remember, okay? Especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper. 
one of those main things that we need to remember is how we are to point, how we are to be that person, how we are to be that entity that points others to Christ. Thank you for coming. And now let's pray. Most gracious and all wise God, we come before you, Lord, just once again, just saying thank you. Lord, I thank you for this lesson in remembrance that you called us to do because of the example that you set for us, because of the ways that you made for us, and the provisions you are still making for us in spite of us. Or there are many times that you called us to go to the right and we went left or we just stood still. But just the same, your grace and mercy uh, has been brought forth into our lives. Uh, you, you kept us in spite of us. And for that, once again, Lord, I'm just saying thank you. Lord, I magnify you because you are so great. I bless you and praise you because of all that you've done and all that you're about to do in our lives. Lord, you've heard the prayer requests and the petitions of your people. Uh, I thank you for the healing that you've already begun in many of us and the healing that you will continue to do in the lives of Tony and some others, Sister Audrey, um, Sister Pat, the healing you've already begun with her. Lord, we know that uh, in your capable hands all things are possible and that once again every concern, every care that we have we can cast before you. We can cast it before you crying. We can cast it before you screaming and hollering uh, because you can take it all. It is because of you, Lord, that uh, we, we are able to do all that we are able to do. All you ask in return for us is to remember. And those things that we need to remember, we need to share. We need to be about pointing others to you. Lord, I thank you again for this class. I thank you for those that are on this call. I ask your continued blessings of protection over each and every one of them. Uh, those that are suffering, Lord, uh, those that uh, are experiencing COVID and COVID symptoms and COVID situations, the aftercare of COVID. Lord, I ask that you continue to heal uh, because we, we know you are a healer. Continue to lead, guide, and direct because we know you as our guide. But most of all, Lord, we know you to be our Savior. And for that, Lord, we're just thankful. These things we ask in your mighty and majestic son's name. Amen. 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 Amen.